Recently, I got into a debate with one of my colleagues over pop culture, more specifically music. Okay, it was over boy bands. <laughs> Now, my colleague was of the mind that the Beatles were the greatest band to have ever lived. <laughs> hey, well, I didn't totally agree or disagree. I heard him out, wanting to contribute to the conversation. I brought up One Direction. <laughs> Now I'm not a directioner. I'm not here to defend their reputation. I never stood in long concert lines or even dedicated a blog to them. But I know a catchy chorus when I hear one, and life is way too short to pretend like you're too cool to like pop music. <laughs> Now my colleague immediately shut me down. He said One Direction and the Beatles couldn't even be compared. One Direction's commercial success could be considered a fluke for two reasons. One, they were cute British boys, and two, they had an army of crazy teenage fangirls backing them. Totally different from the Beatles, right? <laughs> Fangirl. The way he said it, it wasn't exactly a compliment. The word itself has a lot of negative connotations and is often associated with naivete, immaturity, and a larger-than-average white girl lung capacity. <laughs> They told me to practice for the laughs, but I didn't because I didn't think anyone would laugh. So, sorry. <laughs> um, girls who like John Green books, comic books, literature, movies—they're nerds. How about those who actually keep up with the Kardashians or Justin Bieber, other members of pop culture? They're shallow. I disagree. Fangirls are smart, enthusiastic, and creative young women who are the driving forces behind creating content and trends. And as exemplified with the Beatles versus One Direction anecdote, it's not exactly a new model of defining adolescent female enthusiasm. Technology and social media have played a huge part in connecting these girls not only to each other, but for the first time in pop culture history, to the world. Now, social media and technology—they're both still kind of viewed like a boogeyman by an older generation. But it isn't totally just some place where people can track you down on the internet anymore, or okay, maybe it is.、Uh, can't speak for Snapchat. Tumblr, though, <laughs> a popular blogging site, is often used by artists to share, create, and comment on work that may have not had an audience otherwise. This work can include anything from fan fiction to photography, videography, graphic art, studio design—you name it. Some girls probably done it. I was one of these girls in high school, actually, and when I applied for colleges, I thought I wanted to be an artist. My portfolio included many graphic design pieces that featured some of my favorite fan art. I love Taylor Swift and reading, and so I redid some book covers and her. I actually got a $50,000 art scholarship from this.、Oh. <laughs> It did so well that I thought, hey, I should maybe sell this. So I went to Redbubble and I put my Taylor Swift art up as stickers, as magnets, T-shirts for people to buy and sell. This is what it looked like on the website, and this is what the cease and desist from her management team looked like. <laughs> as an artist, I was kind of annoyed, but as a fan girl, I was one degree of separation from Taylor Swift. <laughs> That's a win. <laughs> These social networks, among others like Twitter and Instagram, do a great job of connecting girls not only to each other and helping them make friendships, and also giving artists a platform. It does a great job of giving voices to marginalized groups. Girls themselves are already a marginalized group. At the 2018 Golden Globes, every single person nominated for Best Director was a man. And if you don't see a problem with that, you're going to need more than just some 19-year-old talking at you for 10 minutes to tell you otherwise. <laughs> There is so much diversity that's just being skipped over in mainstream media. People of color, members of the LGBTQ+ community, as well as those as well as those living with disabilities, among others, are often excluded entirely from popular narratives. But fan girls, the girls who support the work, who make it, who love media. They're not just loud white girls crying over Justin Bieber's latest tattoo. They're complex people whose lives and identities are intersections of race, sexuality, and gender. And it's not uncommon for their work, the stuff they put out on the internet, to reflect these unique values and identities. 
there is importance in getting marginalized people to create work. One, it allows them to build their confidence and skill, so that one day, when they're professionals, they're able to do so with clarity, confidence, and skill. And two, representation matters. It allows those, those fangirls who perhaps aren't so artistically inclined, the future STEM majors, businesswomen, politicians, it allows them to perhaps see their own unique and complex identities represented for what could be the very first time. And that's exciting. And it's important to get young girls excited about intellectual work, creativity, but most importantly, themselves. Now, that's great. Kumbaya, self-love, woman self-esteem. To some, that's still not enough to validate fangirls or even women in general. Okay, so let's switch tactics here for those people. Money, marketing. It's no secret that teenage girls love to spend time, money, and resources on the things they love. But there's something more to be said about this pop cultural phenomenon. Fangirls dictate pop culture as we know it. They decide what's in and what's out. John Green books, the entire young adult literature vampire romance section. Kylie Jenner's baby. These things have all defined recent moments in pop culture and have all been assigned popularity by fangirls. These girls don't just have power and social skills and creativity, they have control over these markets. Now, evidence for this can be sometimes hard to find, but I've managed to find consistency across some numbers. Out of the top 10 best-selling books of all time, at least three have notoriously strong, yet notoriously young fan bases. The same can be said for music. In 2012, four out of the five best-selling physical albums all had, as my colleague would have put, crazy teenage fangirl bases to back them up. A fangirl is a marketer's dream. She is the perfect spokesperson. When she loves something, she wants to share it with the world. She posts it. She shares it with all her friends. She puts a hashtag on it. She wants the whole world to see what she loves, and she wants them to love it too. Now, whether or not you like their pics, whether or not you think they're high quality or not, doesn't really matter here. What matters is the control these girls have. To overlook them, to dismiss their obsessions, to say what they're obsessed over is just some stupid teenage phase would be a major faux pas if we want to look at marketing, trends, and frankly, culture as a whole. Fangirl culture also isn't just a place for marketers to live out their biggest fantasies or for teenage girls to share their work or connect with each other. It's also a safe haven where their ideas and excitement won't be squashed down or leered at. It's terrifying to be an adolescent today. The whole world, as a teenage girl, kind of feels like one big predator. This is partly due to the fact that the patriarchal society in which we live in participates and practically encourages the hypersexualization of girls from infancy all the way into their adulthood and then beyond that, too. Sadly, there was a very recent example of this in media. Millie Bobby Brown is the 14-year-old star of the hit show Stranger Things. She's crazy talented, really smart, and has impeccable fashion sense. She's also not that far off from a regular 14-year-old. She loves celebrities. She's a fangirl. If you go to any of her social media accounts, you can watch her interact with them and freak out when they acknowledge her as if she isn't one of them herself now. Recently, however, a magazine decided to call her sexy. She is 14. Underline that. Star that. Put that in bold. She is 14 years old, and already the patriarchal society in which we're living in is putting her into a box labeled sexual object. Now, adolescence should be a time of discovering sexuality and identity, but it should be done away from the harmful gaze put in place by the patriarchy. Through boy band crushes... <laughs> All right. <laughs> I feel it. Okay. <laughs> Through 
through boy band crushes and girl group obsessions, these girls are able to experience infatuation with people their same age for what could be the very first time away from potential adult predators. And these interactions and these bonds these girls make are almost entirely online. Social media and technology play a huge part in our lives, and yet it still isn't looked at thoroughly. To some, it's a shallow way for teenagers to waste time. For others, it's a way for catfish predators to leave a hateful anonymous comment on your profile. No matter how you view social media, one thing is for sure. We have to be raising our girls to be mindful of the content they're creating and consuming so that they can make informed decisions about their own online and offline identities and so that, so that they don't internalize or replicate harmful messages. We should be encouraging these interactions between these girls. We shouldn't be shaming excitement. We shouldn't be shaming girls for being extra. Why is apathy trending? When did it become cool not to care? I'm so tired of being told as a teenager to be cool or likable, I have to be chill. I'm not chill. <laughs> I'm not chill. I'll never be chill. I want to be excited and weird and full of love for the rest of my life, and you should want that for yourself too. We should all be fangirls for the things we love, whether or not it relates to pop culture or not. Cultivating creativity and enthusiasm is nothing to gloss over, especially in young women. These are our future writers, directors, technicians, producers. And yes, while we have many women stepping up to fill these roles now, we will always need more. We're not, excuse me, we're not telling, oh, I got, got it wrong again, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we tell a girl it's okay to love that boy band or that YouTuber, we're telling her her opinions are valid. We're not teaching girls to love social media or pop culture, we're teaching them to love themselves. And what this world needs, now more than ever, are a bunch of self-loving women who aren't afraid to use their larger-than-average lung capacities to scream messages of light, creativity, and acceptance into the world. <laughs>